Hello, good afternoon, and welcome to the Continental Commandery um, May iteration of our virtual lecture series. I want to welcome everyone uh, to see our, uh, well, to be able to share with us uh, with some great guest speakers today uh, and to be able to go a little bit deeper into our rich naval uh, history. So I just want to thank everybody once again for being with us. Um, we are streaming live. Uh, you can see us both on YouTube. And we'll have links on our website later. So uh, if you have a chance to, to reach out to some of our companions and and um, remind them, uh, we're more than happy to be able to share this with as many people as possible. Um, for those of you that do uh, have joined us in the past, you know that we also have the ability to chat and we can take your questions. So we will have the ability on the, the live stream for you to be able to type in your questions and then we'll be able to ask those as time goes on later. Um, we will be sharing some videos with you and uh, hope you enjoy our time today with uh, Master Chief uh, Hakala. So um, I guess first off, just to give a little bit of background and uh, reminder of the Naval Order history and what we do, um, we were put in place on July 4th of 1890. Uh, we were basically a group that met together to identify, um, you know, the importance of the sea services and basically get a group together of members who, that were based upon their service and, and also hereditarily uh, linkages with, with those that have served before and what the descendants will also be able to join uh, together. Um, the one thing about the Naval Order, our mission is that we're here to preserve, promote, uh, celebrate, and enjoy our nation's sea services uh, history and heritage. Um, to accomplish this, we commemorate uh, the American Sea Service heroes and important historical events. We support the study of Navy history um, through writing, speaking, and educational events. We also preserve sea service historical artifacts and documents and monuments, and we promote the camaraderie uh, around our companions' uh, lives and what we do uh, to, to support each other as we move that mission forward. Um, the one thing that is unique about the Naval Order compared to other organizations is that we're one of the oldest um, American hereditary exclusively naval societies. Um, we're also dedicated to the interests of, um, again, encouraging and recording and preserving history. Um, but the provision for membership is is really based upon the lineal descent, ensuring strong continued interest in the deeds and accomplishments of our forebearers uh, in, per, in perpetuity. So again, uh, thanks so much for joining with us. We hope to learn a lot more today, um, again, about our rich naval history, and we have a very special guest with us. So I'd like to ask, uh, actually, Captain Fred Passman to come in and to be able to talk a little bit about our guest. So I, I hand the, the baton over to you, Fred. You might need to unmute. It would help if I unmute my mic. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Captain Bresnahan, and I want to welcome everyone to this afternoon's presentation. Um, Master uh, Chief Hospital Corpsman Mark Hakala enlisted in the Navy in 1981, wherein the, then he attended the recruit training and hospital corps school at Great Lakes, Illinois, a place where I had the uh, pleasure of spending 10 years during my more senior days in the Navy. Uh, after field medical service school at Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, he was assigned to the Naval Regional Medical Center in Newport, Rhode Island. Um, as the corpsman third class, he served in Beirut, Lebanon with Company Bravo, 1st Marine uh, Battalion, 8th Marines, 24th Marine Amphibious uh, Unit from May to November 1983. Uh, then he came back to Camp Lejeune. Uh, made Petty Officer second class in 1985. Um, once he left active duty, he became a member of uh, the Naval Reserve, assigned to 1st Battalion, 24th Marines, 4th Marine Division in Detroit, Michigan. Uh, he deployed with a battalion as hospital corpsman, first class, to Okinawa, Japan during the Persian Gulf War from 1990 to 1991. Uh, in 1997, uh, Master, uh, Master Chief Hakala returned to active duty at the Bureau of Medicine and Surgery to produce historical works for the centenary of the Naval Hospital Corps. Um, 
There he wrote and co-produced a DOD award-winning documentary video. He authored 30 articles for publication and created a permanent historical display at the Hospital Court School. Um, after he released from active duty in 1998, he affiliated with the Naval Reserve Fumet 106 Detachment, where he served as Command Master Chief, and also provided support to the Office of the uh, Master Chief Petty Officer of the Navy and to the Task Force Uniform. Uh, from 2006 to 2009, he served as Command Master Chief of the Operational Health Support Unit National Naval Medical Center, Bethesda, and he finished his 30-year career as a special assistant to the Force Master Chief in, of the Naval Reserve in 2011. Uh, in his civilian profession, he worked uh, for uh, 10 years as Director of History and Education and Curator of the U.S. Navy Memorial Foundation in Washington, D.C., um, has served as consultant to the National Museum of the U.S. Navy, a topic about which we heard back during our January uh, virtual lecture. Um, he served as the executive director of the 25th edition of the Blue Jackets Manual for the U.S. Naval Institute and will be co-author of the 26th edition coming out when, Master Chief? Mm, hopefully later this year. Very good, excellent. Uh, the uh, Master Chief earned a Bachelor of Arts degree in History from University of Michigan in Ann Arbor in 1993. And uh, as is fit for a person who's served 30 years, uh, has his, his salad bowl of, of Navy awards and, and commendations. Uh, without <laughs> taking up any more of your time, <laughs> I'd like to introduce uh, Master Chief Hakla and allow him to uh, brief us to the first presentation. All right, thank you, Captain. So uh, just a wee bit of background on this channel. Um, I worked for the US Navy Ceremonial Guard and 14 months ago, like many places, we stopped doing a lot of the public things that we normally do. And so that left me teleworking every day. And I had all that time that was normally spent commuting and doing other things. And I said, well, I can still teach my sailors if I put together some some videos. So I had to teach myself how to do these, and so they're 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 okay. But uh, I've I've done over twenty five of them. I have a few more that are are ready to be produced, but haven't had the chance to uh, to work on them too much because I'm back to work and back in the office now. Nonetheless, um, what we're going to see is a, is a couple different things. Remember the Maine. Um, the sinking of the USS Maine in 1898 was a pivotal moment in American history, not just naval history, but American history, because it is after that that a whole bunch of things happened where we ultimately defeated Spain in a very short war, and we came onto the global stage as uh, a power that had foreign possessions. So, and a lot of this was sort of hastened by Theodore Roosevelt, who was assistant SECNAV, but he was, uh, he was masterminding a whole bunch of things behind the scenes. And one of the things that he did right before resigning to become the XO of the Rough Riders was he actually bought a bunch of merchant ships and got them to Norfolk in short order, got them painted haze gray. First time we used that color, uh, got um, auxiliary guns on them and made these things auxiliary cruisers. So in a short period of time, he increased the size of the Navy. But all of this was in relatively short reply to the sinking of the Maine in February. So with that as a sort of a setup, why don't we go ahead and roll the video?
teams designed to get new modern equipment would replace the old wooden and ironclad ships and sold. Authorized in 1886, the keel was played in 1888, but delays in giving slip. Maximum meant that the ship wasn't commissioned yet until 1895. Still, Maine was a jewel of the fleet. Photographers from the Ultron Publishing Company came on board in 1896 and took numerous photos of the crew and their lived work environment. Unlike the Army, the U.S. Navy always had integrated commercials. USS Maine was no different and had an ethnically diverse group of sailors on board. In addition to Americans, there were personnel from Canada, China, the Philippines, Japan, Russia, and the United Kingdom. The crew also included 30 African-American sailors. One of these was Dick Turpin. Turpin enlisted in the Navy in 1896. He survived the explosion aboard USS Maine, and then went on to survive an explosion aboard another ship USS Bennington in 1905. By 1917, he rose to the grade of Chief Gunner's Mate, and he was also a qualified master diver. Directly beneath 
of USS Maine are scattered throughout the country. The foremost of the ship is actually at the U.S. Naval Academy in Annapolis. At the Washington Navy Yard, one of the guns of USS Maine was on display and was exposed to the element for decades. A few years ago, it was sent off for conservation. It's been cleaned up. It's in fantastic shape, but I don't think they're going to put it outside. Also at the Washington Navy Yard, just across from the Navy Museum, is a blade from the spare propeller recovered from USS Maine. Since I was at the Navy Yard the other day, I stopped by and took a selfie. I have a couple of things related to USS Maine and sea chips. Here we have a couple of stereoscope cards. Now you see that there's dual images here. If you were to look very closely at the edges of these photographs, you'd see that they're not identical. These were taken by a dual camera, and each lens was set slightly different from the other. The end result would be to mount these photos on a card, and they would be set into a device called a stereoscope. Different versions have been around for a few years, and in 1861, Oliver Wendell Holmes actually invented the did not patent this particular style of stereoscope. What you do is place the card in a holder, and you can slide it forward or backward to adjust for your own vision. The net effect of this, because the two photographs are from different angles, is it creates a three-dimensional image. It's absolutely amazing to see this. Unfortunately, I can't show it to you, but trust me, it does work. And all the hoopla after the loss of the main. All kinds of patriotic souvenirs came from the market. These two buttons, the right one of which has the famous cry, remember the main, are common examples. At this time, several large food companies would sell mustard and other condiments in milk glass jars that had a particular design to them. Several companies did their own take on USS Maine, and these two examples are of the same pattern. Although the ship's design took a little bit of artistic license, it's clearly marked as being USS Maine. In 1998, the 100th anniversary of the destruction of USS Maine, the U.S. Postal Service issued a 32-cent stamp commemorating the ship. Here, once again, we're encouraged to remember the Maine and to remember its Marines and sailors who died in 
excellent presentation, Master Chief. And let me get you unmuted here. So, so um, obviously, when the uh, explosion occurred, there was an immediate reaction. But before the ship was taken out and scuttled, was there a complete survey done, investigation done on the cause of the explosion? There were actually several different investigations done on that. One uh, much more recent than that, that was initiated by uh, Admiral Hyman Rickover. And, uh, but at the time they were able to do as good an investigation as they had the capability to do in 1898. And even to this day, people have some disagreements about what happened to actually sink the main. There, there are some pieces of evidence that suggest that perhaps there was an external explosion. There's many others that say it was likely internal. And uh, so there's not a hundred percent consensus. People, I think, believe that it was uh, internal combustion from the coal bunkers that set off the ammunition in the magazine. There's a question that came in uh, from the uh, chat. One lesson, and what lessons from the main incident have we incorporated into naval traditions? Did we do that? Okay. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I think I think uh, over time there have been a number of. Um, unfortunate incidents in our Navy's history where we've lost ship whatever uh, due to some form of surprise attack. So a lot of the same things that you saw people reacting to with the main, they did with Pearl Harbor. They, they did it in a very similar way. So it was it, perhaps beyond the Navy, but within the public uh, in general. But there's been other such things too too, that uh, once people have found out about them, they've been rather upset. You know, there was even before Pearl Harbor, there was the Germans sinking USS Reuben James, and that led to a famous folk song. So I, I think that within American society, there's been um, a, a willingness to pay attention to on the front lines. Thank you. So what do we have coming up next? Well, this next one is on Commodore Matthew C. Perry and the opening of Japan. And this is, uh, this is um, a topic that long time for several years in the early 2000s, uh, when I was working at the Navy Memorial, I ran a youth exchange program. We had six Japanese high school students, six American uh, high school students, all NJROTC. And we spent 10 days traveling in the U.S. and 10 days in Japan. And after the first year, when I took it over. He said that there's one common element that we can focus on to try to understand the benefits of being friends and the disadvantages of not being friends. The oftentimes you will hear the treaty that Perry um, negotiated, the Treaty of Kanagawa, as a hand for trade, but that is not the case. That was several years later. That was Townsend Harris, who was played by John Wayne in a movie. So this was a treaty of peace and amity, peace and friendship. And it's absolutely amazing. Japan had been closed for several centuries. And so nobody, very few people in the West knew anything about Japan at all. But they picked the right man for the job. Matthew Perry, he had interacted with foreigners in many different nation and uh, a great leader through several different things, anti-slave patrols, the Mexican War. Um, and he went and he found everybody that knew even a little bit about Japan, found people that maybe could speak Japanese uh, and also got people to speak English to the people who could speak Japanese. So he set the whole thing up uh, to be able to open Japan. But by the same token, he had plenty of guns, he had plenty of rifles, and uh, there's there's a quote that I use in the video. Um, he knew he was going to have to talk to a great leader, an emperor or somebody, and he set up a beautiful show for how he presented himself and his own importance. And he said, sometimes when dealing with people of form, it's been Herod. So with that, let's go ahead, see the video.
video is not showing, Fred. Is that better? You got to share your screen. Okay, so when I go, when I go to the um, video on the second one, I can no longer see the screen, and I can no longer tap back and forth. So I'm gonna again share my screen, share the edge tab, maximize that, and take it away. Be 
career, he had numerous diplomatic interactions. Perry had negotiations and discussions with the top admiral of the Turkish Navy, who was the number three in the Ottoman Empire, the Kingdom of Naples, President of Liberia, numerous African chiefs, tribal leaders in Mexico, and a British Royal Navy admiral to discuss treaty issues. When Tsar Nicholas I of Russia met Perry, he was so impressed that he offered to make him an admiral in the Russian Navy. Perry was given carte blanche by the President of the State Department to negotiate the best possible deal he could get, and he plans his expedition meticulously. He found every book in existence on Japan. He got the latest church of captains to the near Japanese islands. He secured illustrators and translators. He gathered gifts for the Japanese from that later, and the best sailors he could get, including captains with whom he served in the Mexican War. Among the eight ships that went with him to Japan on the first visit, three of them, USS Mississippi, his flagship, USS Poetan, and USS Susquehanna, were steam frigates. The sails were augmented by twin side mounted battleships. Perry set off for Japan in 1852, making several stops en route, including Okinawa, which they called Blue Chu because they had a hard time saying Blue Chu. He concluded a treaty to resupply and take on coal. Sending a couple hundred marine sailors ashore probably didn't hurt the negotiation process. Perry reached Japan in July of 1853. When the Japanese saw the American ships entering Tokyo Bay, belching smoke, and moving somehow without sail power, they panicked at the sight of these corrupted black ships and called in military reinforcements to repel the foreigners. Boats filled with soldiers surrounded the American ships, telling them in no uncertain terms to go home. Perry refused to budge. Ultimately, Japanese negotiators came aboard the U.S. ships, and Perry explained to interpreters that he was there to deliver the president's letter to the emperor. Ultimately, the Japanese decided to receive the letter, and they made negotiations on where Perry could land to deliver. The Japanese tried to push for Nagasaki. That was the one port where Sierra Dutch ship and some Chinese ships could do some trade with Japan. Perry refused. Eventually, they settled on Kurihama, a small town south of Yokohama. Boats were landed with Marines and sailors and bands to make for a formal ceremony for Perry's coming ashore. Hasty arrangements were made and two noblemen received the letter, which they did in a formal ceremony on July 14th. The President's letter was passed to Lord Abe Masahiro, who was a sort of prime minister for Shogun Tokugawa Iyasan. Kurihama is now part of Greater Yokohama, and this is the beach where Perry landed when I visited in 2004. There's a small museum there and a monument to honor Commodore Perry's land. These seashells came from the beach of Kurihama. Commodore Perry himself was a seashell collector, and he was actually given a large quantity of them from the Japanese government. With President Fillmore's letter of the Japanese chain of command, Perry left, telling the Japanese that he would be back in a year to get the answer. Much sooner than that, in February 1854, Perry and a larger force of ships returned. Negotiations went back and forth on where to hold the discussions. The Japanese once again recommended Nagasaki. Perry said no to that. And eventually they settled on Yokohama, which then was a tiny village. Perry knew that he would have some difficult negotiations ahead. For this, he drew on his previous diplomatic activities to try to present himself with the greatest advantage. Perry wrote, This experience has admonished me that, in people of forms, it is necessary either to set all ceremony aside or to out Herod Herod in assume the personal consequences and ostentation. Perry chose to out here and here. On March 8th, five sailors and marines were sent ashore in 27 of the ship's boats. Three bands were also sent ashore. The marines and sailors were drawn up in a huge cordon facing inboard. Perry, reaching the beach, steps ashore. Behind him are two of the largest African American sailors in his squad, one carrying the national flag, one carrying Perry's personal pennant. As Perry's foot touched the beach, the troops were brought to present on, and the bands struck up the Star Spangled Band. You know what you call that? An entrance.
Fury's absence, Tokugawa Shogunate had pretty much decided to agree to just about all of the requests in President Fillmore's letter. Still, there were details to iron out. As part of the ports where American ships were sent on cold water and food, the Japanese once again brought up Nagasaki, at which point Harry pretty much had enough and said, please shut the hell up about Nagasaki. So eventually, they decided on two cities, Shibata, 50 miles southwest of Tokyo, and Hakodate on the northern island of Hokkaido. The Japanese agreed to stop the mistreatment of shipwrecked sailors, but they drew the line and trade with the Americans and refused to have that as part of the treaty. Harry realizing that two out of three conditions wasn't bad, agreed. Because neither the Japanese nor the Americans had strong translators in the other's language, but both knew people who could speak Dutch and Chinese. The forthcoming treaty was actually written up in four different languages, Dutch, Chinese, Japanese, and English. This would ensure that the terms for both sides were unambiguous. As the negotiations were progressing, both sides informed to each other. Gifts were exchanged on both sides. But Perry had chosen many of the gifts that he brought with them to sort of make the point that if you open to trade with us, look at all the wonderful things you can get. Among these were modern rifles and muskets, and revolvers which Samuel Colt donated for the effort. Two complete telegraph sets, the operation of which several sailors were trained personally by Samuel Morris. A barrel of whiskey, Madeira, a selection of books, and perhaps the most significant gift was a one quarter scale function railroad set with engine and track. You can't imagine a more interesting sight than seeing hardened samurai warriors riding on top of this train at 20 miles an hour, gleefully circling the track. Additionally, each side threw a huge banquet for the other. The Americans held theirs aboard the USS Poets. There was a lot of food and there was a lot of alcohol, which the Japanese enjoyed in great quantity. Eventually, one of the Japanese who were fastidious on their etiquette and manners actually came up to Perry and threw his arm around his neck. Through an interpreter, he said, Japan, America, all same heart. One of Perry's officers was surprised by this and went to the Commodore and asked why he let him do that. Perry replied, Oh, if they just signed the treaty, he may consider. On March 31st, 1854, the Treaty of Peace and Amity Friendship was signed between the United States and Japan. Because the village of Yokohama was located in Kanagawa Prefecture, the treaty became known as the Treaty of Kanagawa. In 2004, I had the great privilege to be able to see the original copies that Perry brought back with him in the vaults of the National Archives. Perry returned to the United States and was ordered to Washington to prepare a publication called Narrative of the Expedition of an American Squadron to the China Seas in Japan. He completed the work at the very end of 1857. Sadly, three months later, he died of rheumatic fever. Originally, he was buried in New York City, but in 1866, he was reinterred in Island Cemetery in Newport, Rhode Island, 500 yards from the house where he grew up and 200 yards from his older brother, Oliver Hazard. This is me visiting Perry's tomb in 2009. Perry's legacy has continued in many ways. In September 1945, the ensign that flew above his flagship USS Mississippi was sent out to the battleship USS Missouri, and it was mounted on the bulkhead overlooking the formal surrender ceremony in Tokyo Bay ending World War II in the Pacific. There are monuments and statues of Perry in Hama, Hakodate, Shimoda, and Naha, Okinawa. There was even a gargantuan snow sculpture pit done for a winter festival in Hokkaido. But my favorite is in his hometown of Newport, Rhode Island, in Toro Park. Beneath the statue of the Commodore is a bronze jerk encircling the base. The scenes recall Perry's many contributions to the Navy and the nation in nearly 50 years of service in combating the slave trade as a fighter and as a leader, and perhaps most significant as a diplomat to change the course of world events. Check back soon for more content. Thanks for watching.
It's another fascinating presentation, Master Chief. Um, thank you, thank you. I see there's a few I'm questions up. My there are a few questions up, and most of them are about your process. So before we go to that, uh, we know there's a three-year gap between the agreement of friendship and the first trade agreement. Um, what Do you know what was going on during that period? I, I think really Japan was the idea that they were now no longer closed. And so it Perry got as best as he could get with the Treaty of Kanagawa. He kept trying to push for trade, and they said no way. So he said, hey, I'll, I'll take what I can get. As long as you're not imprisoning shipwrecked American sailors uh, and torturing them or killing them, you know, let's let's be happy with that. But I, I really think that Japan had to, um, they, they had to rethink their identity and rethink how they were going to do things. And this proved pivotal because within a few decades, they sent people to, to Britain to learn um, how how to make a navy, a modern navy, they sent people to Germany to learn how to make a modern army. In 10 years of his landing, there was a functioning railroad between, I, I think, Yokohama and Tokyo. So they quickly figured out that, you know, we, we need to catch up if we're going to, you know, be a successful nation. And I think it just took a couple of years to be able to settle into the idea that, okay, we're going to be dealing with these people. Wasn't this almost concurrent with the Meiji Restoration and all the uh, uh, turmoil going on as Japanese uh, government moved from a purely feudal sort of arrangement to the, the quote, yeah, this I think this really sparked the yeah, I think this really sparked the uh, Meiji Restoration. You know, the the whole idea of modernizing the country was planted by Perry, and then uh, again, the the shogunate, you know, was kind of it was time for them to go and you know actually bring the emperor back as something more important than a hood ornament. Exactly. exactly. So, so coming to some of the uh, other questions that come in. How do you decide what you're going to do a video YouTube on? Well, I started by, um, I used the whole idea of the sea chest as if my collection is all in the sea chest, but there's no way my entire collection of artifacts could uh, fit in there. But I, I intended to do some things based on actual physical artifacts that I had and then tie it back into the naval history. So if you look at my very first one, it was on the history of so um, it's getting to the point now where I've covered a lot of topics. Uh, I, I have some work done for one on dog tags, which the Navy doesn't even use anymore. But, you know, the whole concept of those has changed over time. So really, it was based on my artifacts and my interest in, in knowledge. Fascinating. So I think you just answered the second question that's in the chat section where uh, one of the uh, viewers asked, what are your sources for your photos and paintings? Yeah, for the most part, I use National Archives, Library of Congress, Naval History and Heritage Command. Every once in a while, there's some other organization. In this particular one, you saw that there were a lot of things that are hanging on my walls, either in my living room or in my basement. The Newport things and some of these of uh, Perry with the Japanese. Um, those came out of the narrative of the expedition. So I have four of those on my wall in my in my living room. So and then I also had a, a bunch of personal photos from uh, having been to Japan and visited several sites there. But for the most part, I go the big three is Library of Congress, uh, National Archives and Naval History and Heritage Command. Excellent. And, uh, uh, are you a one-person production team, or do you have uh, others helping you put these together? You're looking at it. Just me. So I, um, when I worked at the Navy Memorial for 10 years, I did uh, the graphic design for all of the historical exhibits on the walls. And so I had to teach myself, and there were a lot of similar skills, so I was able to catch up a little bit more quickly than I thought I might. And um, so, yeah, typically I'll identify all the images that I want. I'll rough out my script. Um, I'll, I'll do the narration. Uh, and then I start doing the editing and putting everything together. And so, yeah, it's a, it's a one-man band. 
Do you have any plans of possibly uh, taking over part of it and creating your own museum? I could, <laughs> but uh, I actually created one at work for the Navy Ceremonial Guard, and uh, I've loaned a couple of my things. Uh, you know, back in World War II, the seamen had a, a white band going around the blue jumper shoulder to indicate they were in the seamen branch. Firemen would have a red one. So the former name of our command was the Seamen Guard. So I set up a World War II period uniform and a modern uniform, as well as a number of other artifacts, uh, you know, command ball caps of different eras and uh, unit patches and various and sundry other things. There's some of the things that are in this. It's a very small one, pretty cool stuff. One of the things that we have that I really treasure is there was an urn stand that was made, made for Neil Armstrong's uh, urn for his burial at sea. And so our command master chief at the time, he actually got the wood. He made this uh, this whole thing, trimmed it in black crep. He put his uh, Armstrong's naval aviator wings and his naval astronaut wings on the front of this. And, um, you know, I actually got a chance to hold Armstrong's urns urn before his remains were inside of it. Um, but we have we have a great picture of our casket bearers doing the burial at sea and our firing party firing volleys on this. So, um, so I've I've contributed to uh to that particular museum but uh, i could i could definitely do my own <laughs> okay let's see do you have any videos about the history of the marine corps or maybe the conflict with the barbary pirates um i do do have a video and um during uh during the gulf war in 1991 i was very fortunate enough i was uh i was assigned to uh third marine division headquarters on okinawa and regularly the marines would send flights over to iwo jima for battlefield study so i got a chance to go along um on that and i was uh privileged enough to be able to raise five flags over mount suribachi and one of those was my retirement flag excellent well we hope we uh, can convince you to uh, come back uh, for another lecture with maybe a couple of more of your uh great bits those who haven't gone to the uh, YouTube uh, channel with the Master Chief's um, details, uh, I'm just calling that up now. Uh, the Master Chief's, Chief's Sea Chest, he's got lots of great uh, 10 to 15 minute presentations. Um, I've watched about seven or eight of them so far. And, uh, you know, I thought I knew a little bit about naval tradition, but uh, lots of things I'm learning as I, as I watch YouTube. So it's a, it's a great service you're actually performing for those who have served, those who will serve, and those who are currently serving. And I really appreciate it. Um, I don't see any more questions or comments uh, coming up. And actually, there was so one more. It says, since you're a corpsman, do you more, have yeah. any videos about combat medics? So I actually, I actually took still shots of a bunch of uh, artifacts for some future videos. Um, and one of them was going through a bunch of medical bags and uh, equipment, battle forth. But I haven't had the chance to do the production on that between uh, between ramping back up at work and uh, working on the Blue Jackets manual in the evening. Uh, time for the videos has kind of dwindled, dwindled away. But hopefully before too terribly long, I'll be able to get back to these. Okay, now as, as the proud owner of, I think, somewhere between four and six editions of the Blue Jackets Manual, I, are you uh, thinking about doing a history of the Blue Jackets Manual as one of your YouTubes? Uh, I actually did. That's that's one of my videos. Oh, do you? Okay. I, so I, I, I haven't have, seen uh, it yet, but I will look at that one. I have one representative that's, that's example of, of every edition. Excellent. I think my uh, first one dates from the early 60s. And, and so the, it, even in the, that relatively short 40 year window, 60 year window, uh, the, the Blue Jackets manual has, has evolved quite a bit. Uh, Master Chief, I want to thank you for your presentation this afternoon. I'm going to bring Captain Bresnahan back into the conversation. And again, look forward to uh, bringing you back. Uh, for a future virtual naval history. Wonderful. 
All right. Well, thank you so much, uh, Fred, for <clears throat> for your good uh, work as the MC and for keeping us on track and getting those questions uh, out. And, but uh, Master Chief, thank you so much as well for your service to this country, for all the efforts that you've uh, taken to educate us and make us smarter about what's make this great Navy as great as it is. So I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to going back and looking through your library and, and getting even more uh, insights into where we come from. Um, but again, uh, a lot of what we're doing here in the Naval Order is very much aligned with what you've been doing, and we hope to promote uh, your activities, and we'll certainly make sure all the links to your sites are, are also promulgated as much as we can uh, do on your behalf. Um, but we, as said, we'd love to have you back maybe uh, in the future to talk about other topics. And uh, But again, uh, we thank everybody for joining us. Um, we will be posting this um, on our website, so you know, please tell your friends and make sure that we get the, the word out as much as we can. Uh, the Naval Order is growing all the time, and we're, we're definitely looking for ways to, to create more value in what we do. So I, I know as we're coming up to Memorial Day weekend, I uh, hope all of you have the opportunity to remember, uh, to, to take time to think about those uh, sacrifices that, that we've had to make as a nation and those that have uh, stepped forward. Uh, on on our behalf as a nation. So please enjoy the, the upcoming holiday and I, I wish you all well and thank you so much once again for joining us here in our virtual lectures. All right. Thank you. All the best.